All right, I think we're ready to go. So again, good evening, welcome. This is St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Lewis, Delaware. We're glad to have you here for week two, Coping with Crisis. Our speaker this week is going to be addressing um, um, disconnection and loneliness, which many of us are feeling during this time of social uh, disconnection and, and somewhat isolation. Uh, Tom Ledbetter has been a member of our community and active um, with throughout the state of Delaware for many years. He has been a consultant to the diocese and a number of par parishes. He's worked with clergy and um, lay folks alike. He is an ordained minister in the American Baptist tradition and has a deep, deep background in pastoral counseling and therapy. And so I'll let Tom tell you anything else that he thinks is, that is relevant, but uh, welcome Tom and uh, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that in introduction. And I also want to thank you, Jeff, for suggesting this series. That's a, it's a lovely way to care for your people and for this community, them out in that way. So thank you for that. As he said, we're looking tonight at disconnection and aloneness. And I want to look at four main issues in that disconnection and aloneness. And there's number one will be social isolation in this current situation. And our sense of disconnection, especially among those who may live alone. Secondly, issue I'd like for us to look at would be distinguishing between aloneness and loneliness, as well as looking at our losses during this time of pandemic. Third issue I want us to look at will be finding ways to utilize this current situation to grow. That may sound somewhat selfish and narcissistic. That is, during this time of great suffering and pain and fear and longing, that we'll be talking about growing. But in the biblical tradition, some of the greatest growth would happen at times like exodus and exile, times of great turmoil and difficulty, and some of the great best literature came out of that. Fourth issue I want us to look at tonight would be looking at ways to keep on growing after this unprecedented time is over. First, isolation in this time of pandemic. Our current situation with billions of people cut off from their normal lives is absolutely unprecedented. We have not been here before. I know that my parents and grandparents talked about the Great Depression. This time of pandemic will be something that our children and perhaps grandchildren will be talking about in years to come, what happened in 2020. That is because we're all cut off from others in ways that we have really not known before. Now, as a way of life, so social isolation uh, is a great risk. To be, as a way of life, to be that isolated can contribute to heart disease and cancer, and it can lead to major depression. It's been a great deal of research over the years that shows that our social relationships and our personal relationships are as important to us and to our physical health as it is to our mental health. And we're more aware now in this pandemic than before of the risks and difficulties of being isolated from others. So we're talking tonight about people who live alone and are isolated. We're also talking about those who live alone and, and are not generally isolated, or, but are experiencing that now, as well as talking about many of us who are experiencing this isolation in response to this virus and for our need for safety. Many of us can experience feelings of loneliness and isolation, even though we have FaceTime, Zoom as we're doing now, our phones, social media, television that help us to keep connected and entertained, but we can still feel that loneliness. I wanna look at some brief suggestions for coping 
with this sense of being disconnected and aloneness tonight. And I, I certainly want you, when we're finished, to respond in any way that you can around these suggestions. My suggestions would be, first of all, to accept the reality of this situation. This is horrendous situation, and it's easy for many of us to deny the reality of it. But to accept the reality of this situation requires a surrender to what is. Yes, this is going on, and yes, we are isolated, and may be for quite a while. Second suggestion, besides accepting the reality, would be to realize that others really are in this with us. And that can give us a sense of connectedness. You can see it on television, see it right down here uh, from us on Savannah Road. We are in this together. And that can really, and that's a reality. There are millions and millions of us across the world that are in this together. And that can help us have that sense of connectedness. Third suggestion I would have is to, is to practice a lot of self-care and self-compassion during this time and self-forgiveness. And self-care and compassion and self-compassion are different for all of us, but you know what that means for you in terms of caring for yourself and being compassionate. Fourth suggestion I would have would be to learn how to reach out to others and especially to know when you need to do that. What are the warning signs within your own system that says it's time to reach out? It's time to call family or relatives or friends, not only for myself, but for them. They may need that also. Fifth suggestion I would have would be to create some routine and structure each day. That you learn how to, to set goals to accomplish each day. Set three goals to, to accomplish and, and to set that kind of structure in your life. Next, I'd like for us to look at that second issue, and that is to distinguish between aloneness and loneliness, and then to look at our grief and some of our losses. Aloneness and loneliness are not the same. We often use them interchangeably. We often confuse them. You can be lonely in a crowd of people, terribly lonely, and you can also be alone and not feel a bit of loneliness at all. Like on a three-day vision quest, or a silent retreat and be alone, but not lonely. One is a state of being and the other is an emotion of feeling. And it's really important, especially during this time of pandemic, this time of isolation, to learn how to handle and deal with those feelings of loneliness. So I'm asking each of you tonight, I think we've got 19 participants. How do you handle and deal with loneliness and the loneliness that you may be experiencing during this time of pandemic? What have you found that helps you during this time? It's also important to be aware of some of the things that we have lost during this time of disconnection and, and the aloneness. Some people, you may have lost a, a friend or a relative to this virus. You may have lost a job or know someone that has lost a job. You may have lost a way of life or mobility. You may have lost a sense of security that you once had or a way of viewing the world. I talked with someone recently, a client who said, the way I see the world is now changed forever. What else have been your losses? When we have losses, we need to honor them by doing our grieving. You may have thought of grieving as only that which we do when someone dies, but we have losses all through life. 
children grow up, we change jobs, we get a divorce. It's important to grieve these losses. So what are your losses during this time? What have you had to give up? I had a client one time in Wilmington a number of years ago, a man in his early to mid fifties came in to see me and he was depressed. But he said, I have, I have nothing to be depressed about, but Tom, I can't, I can't get over this thing. And so we talked about what was going on in his life. Four months before that, he had been promoted, I think it was from manager level to vice president. At that time, there were dozens and dozens of vice presidents in DuPont. I said, well, do you not like your new job? He said, no, I love it. I love it. I've been working all my life. I, I wanted to be president of DuPont. That is not going to happen. But I've reached my peak, and I love it. I'll spend the rest of my career doing this, and I absolutely cherish it. Looked at the family. He said, no, I've got two sons. One's in, like, Duke or Vanderbilt or Columbia or Brown, and the other one is doing the same. They're doing great. I'm able to pay for their college. I said, what about you? marriage he said wonderful love of a marriage i said well in, in about the third session we were still puzzling over this and, and i said well tell me about your former job and he started telling me about the people back there and he teared up and i said well, what's going on he said you know i think i missed them and that's why he was depressed he had not done his grieving over the loss of the people that he worked with back there. He thought, I should be happy. I've got this new job. But he got depressed because he wasn't doing the morning labor that would give birth to new life. So we talked, and he did some of the work on that, and then made arrangements to go back and, and take his former secretary out to lunch. And he said, you know, I think I'll do, I'll do that on her birthday each year. And, and he took a go, uh, began having a, a, a golfing with one of the two former guys he worked with once a year. But he could only do that after he had done his grieving because the new job wasn't the same and he could never have that same situation back again. He got depressed because he needed to do his morning labor and to grieve that through. So what are your losses during this time? Well, what have you had to give up? Have you lost a sense of security that you had or a way of seeing the world that's now different? Have you experienced like I have any anger toward this virus? That anger could be a part of your grieving. In just a few moments now, I, I'd love to hear from you if you're willing to be vulnerable and share with us and Share with these other church folks how you're dealing with your loneliness and your grieving. Third issue I would point us to would be, how can we find ways to utilize this current situation to grow? It's a terrible time of suffering and death and pain. And we would honor those who suffer and those who are helping the suffering but we can also utilize this time of disconnection and aloneness as a, as a continual means to grow, to grow personally and psychologically and spiritually. All of this immense suffering is not a good thing at all. We would not choose this, but it's here. We cannot let it defeat us or get in our way. We can use this time of disconnection and aloneness to actually grow. Can you grow in your ability to be alone, to be isolated, to feel lonely? It's not a bad feeling. It's a part of living. And can you know that you're, you know, that you're actually never alone? Because you always have yourself and you always have sacred presence with you always always Henry Nowen that great spiritual leader talked about the spirit's invitation to move from loneliness to solitude could it be 
that you could re-envision this set apart time as Sabbath time? Could you use some of this time apart to experience it as retreat? A time to work on your inner life and your feelings. Did you know that last week in Madison Avenue in New York City, people could hear the birds singing? Did you know that on the Golden Gate Bridge, which is usually furious with traffic, the traffic was so sparse and slow that a coyote walked across the bridge? Our daughter lives, one of our daughters, Shauna, lives in LA. And she goes for walks out in that hillside where you can look down and see the, the, the sign, uh, Hollywood sign, and you can look back and see LA. And she says now there's no smog, that the air is clearer now. A friend of mine lives down the street from me in Savannah Road, a man by the name of Fred Dilla sent me a, 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 a connection, a link to an article in the Atlantic magazine written by Fred Diller is a physicist. And this was written by a man named Alan Lightman, who is a physicist and teaches history of science at, at, um, at uh, uh, MIT. The article in the Atlantic is, is entitled The Virus as a, is a reminder of something lost long ago. In there, he talked about our frenzied lifestyle. We wait 10 minutes for a doctor and, and we're impatient. We're on the go. Donna and I, in, in either Lewis or Rehoboth last year, were eating at, at a nice restaurant. And we looked over and there was a table with two parents and three children and each one was on their tablet or phone. They weren't talking to each other. They were talking with other people. Lightman talks about our busyness, how we've lost touch with something. Listen to what he says. He says, there's something more to be regained, something more subtle, more delicate, almost impossible even to name. And that is the restoration of our inner selves. This is a physicist talking. He says, by inner self, I mean that part of me that imagines, that dreams, that explores, that is constantly questioning who I am and what is important to me. He goes on to say, my inner self is my true freedom. My inner self roots me to me and to the ground beneath me. The sunlight and soil that nourish my inner self are solitude and personal reflection. When I listen to my inner self, I hear the breathing of my spirit. Those breaths are so tiny and delicate I need stillness to hear them. I need slowness to hear them. I need vast silent spaces in my mind. I need privacy. Without the breathing and the voice of my inner self, I am a prisoner of the frenzied world around me. I'm a prisoner of my job, my money, the clothes in my closet. What am I? I need slowness and quiet to ponder that question." End of quote. In this stillness, can we use this time even of isolation to grow, to learn, even in a time of disconnection and aloneness? Let's look lastly at ways to keep on growing after this unprecedented time has passed. I hear a lot of, uh, of desire to return to normalcy, to go back like it was. 
if we're true to our inner lives and we make gains and learnings and growth during this time, let's not go back to how it was. The gains that we make and the ways we grow during this disconnection need not be lost, but our dominant culture will want us to go back to the way it was. So how might you hold on to your gains, your learning, your changes, your growth, and not go back to some things? Someone wrote online this past week, take a deep breath, ignore the deafening noise, think deeply about what you want to put back into your life. This is our chance to define a new version of normal, a rare and a truly sacred, yes, sacred opportunity to get rid of the BS and to only bring back what works for us, what makes our lives richer, what makes our kids happier, what makes us truly proud. So the five issues, I, I violated all the rules for leading group discussion. I'm giving you five big things to think about. I hope you'll join me. How might we better help those who live alone and help ourselves who are isolated? How do you deal with your loneliness during this time? What do you grieve during this time of disconnection and loneliness? What are your gains, your learnings, your personal and spiritual growth during this time? And how can you consolidate those changes and keep them instead of going back to normal? I love your input, questions as well as responses to these issues in this time. Jeff? Thanks, Tom. That was wonderful. Sorry about that. I was muted. Um, at this time, Tom's asked us to engage in conversation about the five points that he's raised. And if you have a question, uh, you can either uh, raise your hand like this, or down below, there is a reaction button where you can do this, as you see with me now, it lets us know that you have a question. So if uh, anybody has something they'd like to share or raise. Tom? Tom, the, uh, you asked about what do, what do you grieve at this point? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how to explain it except because I'm on Zoom all the time with people from the congregation, but it's the congregation that I miss. You must have, uh, <laughs> Um, and I don't really know how to handle that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a, there's a fear with that, that this is going to go on so long that I don't know whether I'll ever see the congregation again. Mm -hmm. Right. So how you're dealing with it by using Zoom? And dealing with and dealing with the feelings of fear that you may never go back to how it was. Well, I don't know how to deal with that. Right. Well, keep on feeling it. Keep on talking about it. You talk with Tom about it. Off and on, yeah, we talk. Good. Can you write about it? I haven't tried that. <laughs> Try writing about it. I'm keeping a journal during this virus. That's just about what we're what I'm doing now in terms of my fears and, and, and what's going on here. So try a journal there, Ray. That might be of help to you also. Okay. But don't be don't be afraid of Donna will talk with you about this next week in her presentation. Don't be afraid of those dark feelings. No. They're real. They're okay. They're no, I, I know that. that. Learn. Yeah. I know that. Uh, Eleanor? Um, the thing I'm missing the most, other than people and interacting with people, which I can do through the phone and I can do through time and Zoom, 
is realizing I don't know when I'll get physical contact with people again. Yeah. And that's going to be a long no, time. And there's sure. no substitute. Right. Yes. Yeah. I, I certainly miss the people at, at, at uh, going out to dinner with friends, going to ch church and seeing people. I, I miss the uh, passing of the peace. Yeah, but I don't know when I'll ever get a hug from anybody in a long time. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Eleanor, here's a virtual hug for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barney. <laughs> but let's hear what Eleanor's saying is that is that she misses the physical contact the physical too, you know, as well. Sure, both. Mm -hmm. Is there someone else that wanted to? Raise question or a concern. Tom, can you talk a little bit about the um, experience that you know when we when we're missing something or when we're feeling disconnected? That actually trying to engage in it, like if we're missing talking to people, actually you know, spending some time talking to people and calling them and trying to connect. Can you talk a little bit about how that, um, how that works? It's kind of, um, I think, counterintuitive, but the more we sometimes, if we're feeling cut off, the more we try to connect, the more sometimes we find ourselves feeling connected. Feeling that connected make sense? or cut off? Excuse me? I, I didn't hear the last part. You said the more we make the contact, the more we make an effort to connect, how, how it helps us feel more connected. Yes, right, it does indeed. But, but again, I think two things are important there, and, and that is to, to learn the, the meaning of the feelings of disconnection. And by all means, to, to connect as much as you can with people, but, to, but to also to look inside in terms and to see what people do mean to you. As Eleanor's talking about, missing hugs from people, missing that kind of contact. But look inside to see the meaning of all of that and what people mean to you. This is an opportune time when we're isolated to look at you know, what people mean, our past relationships that have not been so good, or people, how we want to relate to people at church or friends in, in the future. But by all means to reach out, not only, as I said earlier, not only for yourself, but for other people. Whom do you know needs a phone call? I'm, I'm glad we've had that, that chain of contacting people. I've enjoyed uh, talk, talking with my folks during this time. And who, who needs you to call them also? And that can meet a need of yours also. So who's, who's experiencing what in terms of uh, this isolation? Tell me what's going on with you. And uh, I'm, I'm asking you to risk being vulnerable, I know, but I think we can do that here. Jackie? Um, I'm sorry. I guess, I guess you raise your hand. Is that what we're doing here? Yep, that's what we're doing, Jackie. So, um, sorry to be a little late, but um, one of the things that I was sitting here thinking about is um, before all this current situation, I'll just leave it at that, started, I was able to go to nursing homes with Henry and visit people who were already pretty isolated. And it almost feels like a double whammy. And very selfishly, I miss that ability to, to, to go and, and visit. I mean, it, it, it's, mm -hmm. it makes me, there's a part of me that feels lonely that I can't do that. And I also think, well, what must, what must it be like to be in a facility, whatever kind of facility it is, and you can't have any visitors? Yeah. I'm just yeah. struck by the, the loneliness of that because I've seen the joy when a silly dog walks in <laughs> and, and now that's even taken away. Yes. And it, it feels just very sad. 
to me. And it, and it is very sad. And, and mm -hmm. he, the four of us, you and Candy and I and Donna were talking the other night, what, what would it be like to enter this uh, pandemic having recently <laughs> lost a spouse, you know, in the last <clears throat> year? And how, how incredibly uh, awful and alone that might be at times. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I feel, I don't feel particularly lonely because I have candy, I have Zoom, I have my church community, but there are people who don't have that. And I yeah. think, oh my goodness, what must, uh, what, what must that feel like? And what could we do to, I've even thought about taking Henry up to the window in some of those places and telling the people that work in there to bring people down so they can at least see, mm -hmm. I don't know, see somebody else besides, yeah. anyway. That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. I'm, going, I'm going to mute. All right, Sherry, I, I think, yeah. was next, and then well, Ted know, Olson. Um, Jackie, in, in terms of the, the nursing homes, and I know that Bonnie knows Barbara mm -hmm. um, from Brandywine, and to add to the loneliness I, is that my father passed away about a month ago, and he, he lived across the hall from Barbara in Brandywine. So I've, I've been in touch at Brandywine, the one behind Giant. Um, they cannot leave their rooms. Right. right. No. So the, their meals are brought to them. It is excessively mm. lonely. If they have a window, Jackie, it's a great idea. Uh, you know, if they have a window to the outside as opposed to the courtyard, they would take that. They'd love to have you do that. Yeah. You know, to take the dog or, you know, wherever mm -hmm. you live. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I actually miss going to Brandywine every day. Terry, I'm so sorry to hear about you losing your father. I didn't know that. Um, well, thank you. You know, it, uh, he was 98. He had 98 great years, uh, four lousy months. Yeah, and, at least that's a whole. Yeah, and and this this would have this would have killed him more than anything else too. So, and he did not die from COVID. It was, yeah. you know. 98-year-old stuff. <laughs> Ted, you were going to ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it was, it was more uh, of an observation and uh, something you had touched on, um, Tom, about the, the social isolation and uh, the, uh, the idea of aloneness and loneliness. And, and I was thinking you mentioned exile, exodus, those kinds of things. And in many ways, this is, uh, at least for myself, a kind of a desert experience. And I, I think whenever I, th I think of like desert experience, and you know, we, we've often tried to kind of uh, simulate that in the beginning of Lent when we talked about Christ in the desert and what that's like and so forth. Well, here we are living in it in, in, a, in real time in a very real way. Yes. And, and, and the desert, it biblically, as I understand it, is, is that place where all the ghosts and the demons and, and the terrors of the night come out, you know? Mm -hmm. And this can also be a time where, while it, it's a strange time, while it can be a time of great creativity uh, and growth, it can also be a time when those demons do come out, if you will, to torment us, you know, whether they're demons of self-doubt or anxiety, um, guilt. I mean, I think a lot of folks may feel guilt. I was in a, um, a, a it was kind of a, a webinar today uh, from Omega Institute, and they were talking about you know, the guilt that we feel because we might be doing well as opposed to some folks who are really suffering and in yeah. hospitals working in, in hospitals or in nursing homes and so forth. So, I mean, it's a time when our, our, our if you will, our demons and our, our own inner turmoil and struggles come out because we don't have the typical activities which either distract us or which help us. For example, I think of people like in 12-step communities who can't go to 12 step meetings because uh, of the isolation. Yes. And um, so we, we, I mean, there is that other dimension as well and you, that you hit on in terms of the idea of loneliness. And I just, I was going off on that idea of, of the desert and I'm sure Donna will be talking about that because I think that'll be part of the, 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 the if you will, the darker side of things that, come, that comes out in the, these times. Thank you.
Is there someone else who had their hand up? Um, oh, John, please. Yeah. Um, I think what I've been finding is that if you can stay in the present, don't look back with nostalgia on the past, don't look forward to what may come, what may be next month, week, or even next year, but just stay in the moment. I'm finding that uh, when we go out to do our necessary trips for groceries or CVS or wherever, uh, those contacts that we have um, sometimes with the people working there, which we thank them for, but also just total strangers. You know, they, uh, they're not big events in, in my life or, or certainly not in theirs, but uh, they take on a new meaning and just uh, a smile to a, you know, from a stranger or smiling and, and waving to a stranger, it, it, it takes on a new significance at times like these. And uh, mm. you know, we are all connected. Yeah. And this is a time, I think, that we need to celebrate that. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and I, well done. Thank you. And I, I may be fooling myself, but I'm actually enjoying um, taking care of my neighbors. We live in a relatively close community. And uh, John and I both love to cook. So we make these huge batches of things and we go over and we ring the doorbell and leave something and go. And, um, and it's funny, it's starting to come back. People come ring our doorbell and bring us cookies. Yeah, we've or, got a, yeah. a nice sort of exchange of uh, yeah. uh, nice. potlatch going on here. Uh, one of the, uh, I've also found a lot of comfort in poetry and I've not, I've not really been one even a long time who read a lot of poetry, but I've been reading it more and more. And one thing that keeps coming back in my mind was um, a poem that Robbie, Robbie Burns uh, described as his autobiography. And I won't quote it in, in its entirety, but the first line is, uh, contented with a little and canty with more. Mm. Merit, rather. Canty with merit, which means, I'm happy with what I have, and uh, if I get more, that's wonderful. But uh, you know, be content with what you have is is a blessing. And when one is blessed, one wants to bless others. The reverse is also true. Again, well said. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Denise. Yeah, I have to unmute. No, you're fine. We can hear you. You can hear me. Okay. Yep. Um, well, I've got several friends who have used this time to, you know, just go gangbusters and get all kinds of stuff done around their house and a bunch of clean out all the paper and, you know, get the gardens going and all this sort of thing. And I haven't done that for various reasons, not because fear of the virus really, but just for other health issues and so on. And I feel like I'm, sort of like left behind. I feel like time doesn't stop very often. And now this virus has made time stop for all of us so we could actually get caught up. But mm. I feel like I'm not take you know, I can't take advantage of that because of the other issues I've had. So I just feel like, gee, my friends are all getting way ahead of me on all these household things and, and <laughs> I can't get that done. So that's that's where I am. <laughs> There's time left now. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't beat yourself up about it. The house always needs to be cleaned. <laughs> True. <I know. laughs> I'm way behind, way behind. But you know, they say time and tide stop for no man, but I feel like gee, time actually has stopped here for us if I'm not taking advantage of it. Well, I cleaned my office up. You know, those of you who've been in my office know it needed it desperately, and <laughs> I've, I've simplified considerably. So, um, you all have to come take a tour when when this is all over. <laughs> you know my address, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, Denise, I'm going to tell you something. My mother used to say. Don't spend a lot of your time cleaning because when you die, they're going to dump dirt on you anyway. So don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
and, and maybe with this time, Denise, just relax and heal. Well, yeah, that's what I should do. Best is, is the best. Can you, can you do it? Well, thanks. My husband tells me that. You know, yeah. but, uh, no right. Yeah. You know. Okay. Kind of, Anybody else have a question or a thought to share? I was just, again, just thinking about, you alluded, Tom, to uh, the Depression and folks who had grown up in the, and parents, grandparents who had grown up in the Depression. Yeah. And um, I just know my own parents have been grown up with that and how they have kind of like really regard as precious, you know, the little things. Don't throw that out. You might need that someday or save this or what. Yeah. And that coming away from that experience of want has left them with a, an appreciation for things mm -hmm. that I think I'm wondering about like this time of want will leave us, what kind of appreciation it will leave us with, you know? Mm -hmm. So to your point about what is our new normal going to be? Mm -hmm. So you all know normal is just a setting on a washing machine, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. And it, and it, it that, broke uh, on mine. <laughs> and that uh, nothing is ever the same. Right. Exactly. Well, um, Tom has his hand up. Oh, who does? Tom? Oh, Tom, go ahead. Um, just an observation from uh, my traveling yesterday. I was in the drugstore, first time I'd been in a store in I think over three weeks. And I noticed that something was strangely odd. And that's that I missed all the smiles. Mm. I missed all the, the mouth expressions, you know, but mm. mostly yeah. the smiles. And so I began to look up and began to it. read eyes. Mm -hmm and was able to see people smiling with their eyes and saying hello mm. with their eyes like that. And I really appreciated that. Mm. I'm comfortable in my aloneness. I think I've struggled with that years ago when I went through a divorce and was uh, learning to live on my own. Um, but it's the small things that I miss now. I guess it's the smiles, it's the traffic on the road, you know, we can go hours here and not hear a car <laughs> and wonder where did they go? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. They're home like we are. Donna commented the other day that when we pull out of our driveway here on Savannah Road, often nowadays, uh, we don't have to wait a long time. There's so little traffic on the mm. road. Yeah, it makes a difference. Yes, it does. Yes. Anybody else? Uh, Chris, go ahead. I'd, I'd like to return to a comment you made, Tom, briefly at the beginning. Uh, you mentioned Sabbath. Mm. And in some ways, I feel that about this time, uh, that we can treat it that way, or it can become mm. that way for us. Uh, we... Um, we've been removed from all of our accustomed busyness. And uh, if we, to me, if, uh, for me, if I can treat it as that is, it's almost holy. Mm. And maybe, just maybe, um, I can emerge from this. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could comment on that. And maybe Jeffrey, you might also have some comments on that. Go ahead, Tom. Okay, yeah. Uh, it, you know, it, it's such a, a primary part of our own uh, heritage out of Old Testament, and that is that mm. uh, Shabbat, that Sabbath is such an important time for them. And to set aside, I mean, that e even that God rested is a powerful, powerful piece of theology and theme. And therefore, the Hebrew people knew they could be busy six and rest on the Sabbath. The Sabbath also is a, can be a way of life, and that is that each day, uh, Marcus Borg taught me this, that two or three, four times a day, I'll simply uh, experience Sabbath. I'll simply, oh, oh, 
I am being held. I am being held in this Sabbath moment. So Sabbath mm. can be a day, it can be a moment, it can be simply stopping for a little while to, to, to experience Sabbath. This time together can be an important stopping and not going back to how it was, but to learn from Shabbat, to learn mm -hmm, from Sabbath, mm -hmm. that um, uh, the, 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 the time set aside is precious. Mm -hmm. I've noticed the birds in my backyard more this year than ever before. It's nesting time. They're, they're mating, the cardinals and, and, and the robins. I've noticed the, uh, what seems to be the slowness of the leaves growing, the, the buds growing into leaves in the backyard. And I, I was thinking today, that's been a part of my Sabbath, is to simply, with all the rain, to look outside my office here and to, and to see the backyard turn green mm. and the leaves and to mm. just stop for a moment to, to appreciate and say, yes, yes, this is a holy moment. I can catch my breath. And I have yes. time to do that now. That for me, you know, a Sabbath can be, like I said, it can be a day, it can be a moment, it can be an experience, it can be simply stopping. It can be, um, I've known people to do 30 and 60 day Sabbaths of, of simple quietness. Yeah. Jeff, you had anything? Yeah, I was gonna share, I couldn't lay my hand on the book because I'm still putting my bookshelves back together again, but there's a, <laughs> book on Sabbath keeping by Marva Dawn. And she talks about, there are really four um, aspects of Sabbath keeping. Um, the first is ceasing, where we stop doing things. And, um, you know, right now, there, we're all very conscious, I think, of the things that we miss. Mm -hmm. But this is also an opportunity to think about the things that we've had to stop that we don't mm -hmm. want to ever start again, for whatever reason. Um, so, you know, thinking about the things that you miss is, is important, but also thinking about the things that you were doing that mm. you don't want to do anymore. Mm. Um, the second thing that she talks about is resting and the importance of, of taking rest. I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, I don't know why, but I suddenly need to take a nap in the uh, afternoon. And I said, well, maybe you're just suddenly aware that you are tired in the afternoon and you've always needed a nap. Maybe it's not caused by the pandemic. It's just that your body is saying that this is part of your natural rhythm. So yeah. really being conscious of taking um, rest, making sure that you get enough sleep every night, which many Americans are very bad at, but which is really essential in helping to uh, keep your body strong and fighting off infection. The, the third aspect she talks about is embracing. And, you know, Tom's talked about, you know, living into this time and living into the now, but also, you know, recognizing as, as Jackie was talking about our, our relationship and our connections, the things that we do that we're really passionate about, the things that we do that we really enjoy, the things that are important to us um, that we don't want to lose when we go to a different level of social engagement as dictated by, you know, the, what's going on with the pandemic. Yeah. And then the last aspect she talks about, which, you know, we, we don't think about much, as much when we think about Sunday, but, um, you know, the ask, one of the aspects of the Sabbath used to be that uh, not only did everybody go to church, but then everybody had a big Sunday dinner. Yeah. And so the, the last aspect for her is feasting. Now, this doesn't mean, you know, suddenly gorging yourself on everything you can find. But, <laughs> but instead, she, she talks about, you know, making an event and uh, of, the, right. of the time that we have. So like this evening, um, the last couple of nights, uh, Sheila and I have been busy and, and uh, Morgan's been busy and we haven't been able to sit down at the table together. And Morgan texted us this afternoon and said, we need to have a family dinner tonight. And so uh, we, we all had an opportunity to sit around the table and to be together. I know Catherine and Mark have been doing um, Zoom family calls. She talked last week about having uh, a feast uh, for Easter, connecting with her kids, one in California, one in Boston, and them down here. So just because we're uh, physically separated from one another doesn't mean that we can't drink in the um, 
the celebration of being together, albeit virtually. Um, somebody just told me about a new app called House Party. And, oh, yeah. Uh, some of you know a friend oh, yeah. of mine up in uh, Elmira, Don Matthews. He and his wife, Margaret, are going to join us um, tomorrow night for an online Zoom game night called House Party that you can get on your phones. And you can play along with each other and pretend like you're physically in the same room, but really be present to one another in conversation and presence. So, so consciously feasting on um, the opportunities to engage and connect, I, I think, are really important as well. Okay. Well said. Anybody else? All right, Tom, do you have any closing thoughts you wanted to share? Or? No, that's, that's it for me. Just okay. thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you. I thank really you, appreciate the benefit of your wisdom and your experience. Um, Donna, do you want to give a little teaser for next week? Oh, sure. Um, the topic is going to be uh, dealing with dark emotions. And of course, we have dealt with some of those with Catherine and with Tom tonight. Um, so maybe um, just get your minds thinking and consider some of the most difficult feelings or emotions that have surfaced for you during these weeks. Um, maybe think about what effect they had on you, um, what they meant to you, you know, what you felt about those feelings, There's that kind of thing. And that will help us um, have a good discussion after I give my presentation. So I'm looking forward to being with you next week. Great. Thank you. Tom, Thanks, were you yeah. trying to, Tom uh, Carlson, were you trying to say something? No, just a tick. Oh, just a tick. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you'll notice in the chat uh, window to your right or at the bottom of your screen that I've posted up the schedule for the next couple of weeks. As I said, the presenters have uh, kind of retooled a little bit and um, tightened up our schedule and so it's there and it'll also be e-blasted out next week if you uh, don't want to cut and paste it off your screen right now. But uh, as you can see, Donna's our presenter next week and I thank her for her willingness to, to uh, help in the next step along in this process. I pray you all are well and, and taking care of yourselves and, and helping us take care of each other. If you have any needs or if there's that if the church can help in any way, please do call me on my cell phone and uh, know that you're all in my prayers. And uh, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Peace, peace of God be with you all. Yes. And with you. God bless. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.